Mr. Chairman, sir, and friends, it's an honor to be here and conduct this session on bugs, drugs, and implant considerations. So, Vikas Agash's law of adaptation. Yesterday, microbes listened to us. Today, they have found ways to defy us. But on the other hand, yesterday there was a very famous joke. The only difference between orthopedic surgeon and carpenter is that carpenter knows more than one antibiotic. Today, I can see at least 100 people here, maybe a little more, who are keen to know about rational use of all antibiotics. I mean, that's very important, rational use. So to discuss this, we are privileged to have fantastic faculty. Dr. Shauli Basu, he's a microbiologist. Dr. Umang Agarwal, who is an infectious disease specialist. Dr. Mayank Vijayvarya, who is uh, our orthopedic surgeon consultant. And uh, myself, Vikas Agashe. So we start with debate. Debate between myself and Dr. Mayank. Why are we having a debate. I propose that we'll have two or three antibiotics one day prior to surgery till suture removal because I feel maximum safety is important. While my uncle would say first or second generation antibiotic, cephalosporin, for 24 hours and no more. And Dr. Umang would decide who is the winner. Question is why are we doing this? So in last two years, I have conducted survey amongst more than 600 orthopedic surgeons. And almost everybody said that they would give injectable antibiotics for three to five days. They'll continue with oral antibiotics and generally till suture removal. The reason for continuing with oral antibiotics was either poor hygiene or we are not very happy with our OT setup. So there was a clear mandate for giving antibiotics as prophylaxis in close fractures for more than 24 hours, generally till suture removal. So why, why is this thinking as opposed to the international thinking of giving a, for at the most three, three doses? The reason is, my young, we have more common sense than you. Because this is an insurance against infection. And you would not like have your premium of 400 rupees, correct? You will have your insurance which you, the best you can have. Money is no consideration. So why not have two of best antibiotics? The reason is, what is the cause of this orthopedic infections or infection after close fractures. It is commonly through the skin bacteria that is Staph aureus or gram-negative bacteria that is through Staph aureus, inappropriate OT problems. And there was an editorial almost seven years ago in ISAO. And they say that our world is different. In our country, theater conditions are not good. Patient population is not very good. So unless we have large studies, we cannot decide what is to be done. And this was a large study published after another four years from Ames. And they said that out of these 92 positive isolates, 61% were gram negative. So Mayang, you still want to continue with only gram positive coverage? So my idea would be, I'll kill all these bugs before even they enter the body. So one previous night, I give this antibiotic cocktail. So whatever little antibacteria enter, I'll keep giving medicines, I'll keep giving antibiotics till there is nothing, there are no bacteria. So I'm sure Dr. Mayank would say this will lead to antibiotic resistance globally. Yes, maybe. But think global, act local. I'm more concerned about my own patients. So in my opinion, total three doses of first or second generation cephalosporin is nothing but imported vichardhara in a desi mahol. So 
friends a there is a clear mandate for longer antibiotics common sense tells us that we should have better insurance and lastly good publications in iso all they say that probably we are different stage is yours mike Good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank the Viroc organizing team and Akashi sir for having me here. So this was the last concluding slide from your presentation, and it was totally not backed by evidence, but lagged by evidence. If I would like to conclude one message from your presentation, then it would be "Jada hai to better hai." But sir, if that is so, why don't you add more salt to your food and more sugar to your tea? so my stand against your first point of giving higher antibiotics is that you have totally forgotten why do we give prophylactic antibiotics is to prevent against irritable organisms which are coagulase negative staphylococci and staphylococcus aureus and which respond to first and second generation of cephalosporins this is the paper which you have presented in your presentation and i agree that 61% of the culprits were gram negative organisms but sir what you have skipped intelligently is that there is a varied microbial flora and varied antibiotic susceptibility to the point that only one out of two organisms would respond to stronger and higher antibiotics like imipenem or meropenem so sir if you want to kill all the organisms then you don't need antibiotics you need a nuclear bomb gram negatives are not colonizing flora they are the fallouts of poor infection control there is a no full proof reliable option which is left and your expertise your an expensive antibiotics will not protect against infections my stand against your second point of starting antibiotic one day prior and continuing it for more than 24 hours is that when iv antibiotics given half hour prior to incision it reaches the surgical site and when incision is taken all the organisms which enter the surgical area the sub susceptible organisms are been killed by this antibiotic once the skin is closed there is hardly any chance of bacteria entering hence there is no reason to give more than one dose or at the most continue antibiotics beyond 24 hours why not start antibiotics one day prior because then it would kill all the susceptible bacteria but there can never be a microbiological vacuum the resistant organisms will keep on multiplying and when an skin incision is taken all these resistant organisms will enter the surgical site and will not respond to your antibiotic even if given for extended period and this has been proven even in the literature that when prophylactic antibiotics is given more than 2 hours prior to the incision there is a six fold increase in the infection rate so the major culprit is not a staph aureus but instead staph aureus our duty is to improve the ot setup train the staff and not give antibiotics which are worth thousands finally if one has to salvage the fixation it has to be done within 4 to 6 weeks prolonged antibiotics will mask the infection temporarily we will lose our window to debride and my stand against your last point of popular vote and democracy is that once upon a time even the masses believed that earth is the center of solar system but that is not right so what people believe and what democracy thinks is not always right my dear sir wrong is wrong even if everyone is doing it and right is right even if only you are doing it and we don't want to follow what is been what is been called as bhed chal it's a war against microbes i don't think field marshal maniksha ever asked for a vote let me take you 15 years back when a prospective study at hinduja hospital clearly showed that the infection rates were higher in patients who were given higher and prolonged antibiotics so sir stop this drama and accept that this study convinced you to follow less is better from pd hinduja hospital to your agashi nursing home where you still give three doses of first and second generation cephalosporins thank you mayank uh, in fact nahin. continue in fact we played a drama me as well as mayank as well as everybody at uh, hinduja 
don't stop. We have been using the policy that Mayang described, Dr. Mayang described, and the antibiotic protocol is three doses of first or second generation of cephalosporin, whatever may be the indication of for close surgery, whether it is joint replacement or a tendon repair or fracture repair, 30 minutes before incision, see to it that you don't give in the ward and then by the time patient comes back, it's two hours. Five minutes before inflation of tourniquet, repeat dose if surgery prolongs beyond four hours or there is blood loss of almost 1500 cc and not beyond 24 hours even in clean surgery. Thank you, friends. Thank you, Mayank. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mayank has to leave. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mayank. Thank you. He has to go to the other hall. My next presentation, please. Now we are going to have an interactive session uh, with Dr. Shaoli and Dr. Um, Umang Agarwal and uh, related to bugs and drugs and implants. First and foremost, there will be some culture reports which are altered for educational purposes and we do not promote any brand. The, whatever photographs we are showing is only for representative purposes. So that's our flow. So I start with a case. Middle-aged person, diabetic, had a fractured distal femur somewhere else and he presented at 10 weeks for second opinion. Tracing history, there was a discharge from surgical site at two weeks. He was treated with empirical antibiotics. Unfortunately, the discharge persisted. The primary surgeon explored at four weeks, debrided and he decided to retain the implant or plate and he started him on Zephyr Turbo. This was a culture report which was methicillin sensitive Staphylococcus aureus. And at 10 weeks he presented to us, he had minimal swelling, no pain, movements were almost full, he was walking reasonably well and CBCSR, CRP were normal. So when we assessed, he had a duration of infection, two weeks, so early infection, reduction was stable by docking, implant position was not ideal, but yes, acceptable, stability was good, bug was oral option available, and he had a good soft tissue cover. So all that, we decided that we will not explore nor take out the implant, and he had an uneventful healing at nine months. Question is, what do we do at this time? Do we take out the implant because he has had infection once? Obviously, nobody wants to do that. Now, two years after surgery, he presented with obvious infection, severe knee pain, effusion, warmth, raised markers. MRI, Mars MRI was done which showed effusion and distal femoral osteomyelitis, as you can see here. So obviously, now the fracture is healed. He has obvious infection. We decided to take out the plate. So we excise the scar, necrotic tissue, and you can see there's a significant infection underneath the plate. So as we started removing that slimy layer and uh, excise the granulation tissue, we realized that the distal portion of the plate, there was a big khadda there. Uh, the screw holes, uh, everything was infected. And that is, that corresponds to the MRI. And uh, you can see this is after a thorough debridement. Fortunately, there was no abnormal mobility at fracture site. The culture report was exactly similar. Same microbe, same sensitivity as like the earlier one and this is one year follow-up and no recurrence. Dr. Shaoli, can you join me? I have some queries. These are three reports, two reports from this patient where first is written high moderate resistance, 
in second positive negative susceptible resistance and there is another report of staph aureus from another patient where even MIC is mentioned. So I am thoroughly confused with that and I would also tell you that we as orthopedic surgeons really get upset when we read these terms beta lactamase positive, cefoxetine screen positive, benzene penicillin resistance. Oxacillin resistance, there is no mention of methicillin, methicillin and then you say it is methicillin resistance. And the last is totally Latin for us, inducible clindamycin resistance. So will you explain us? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving our micro microorganism the chance to be among these major orthopedicians. So, uh, coming to high, moderate and resistant, uh, probably they mean that it is highly resistant or intermediate resistant. That's what the report probably suggests, but currently that's not the recommended method of uh, interpretation. So, international guidelines recommend that we uh, put it as susceptible, intermediate or susceptible dose dependent or resistant. Uh, now coming to beta lactamase uh, positive or negative. So, now before that let's understand what are these beta lactam drugs. So like drugs like penicillin, cephalosporins, monobactams, carbapenems, these are antibiotics which have a beta lactam ring. Now if we are smart, the microbes are smarter. They got adapted to this and they started secreting enzymes called as beta lactamase enzymes. So as you can see on this, this is a beta lactamase enzyme. So what it does is the break open the beta lactam ring as a result of which the beta lactam antibiotic is inactivated. So uh, now the microbe thought that they are smart. So we thought let's be a little more smarter and then we came up with beta lactamase inhibitors. So when I talk about beta lactamase inhibitors that means these work on that so that the ring which was exposed or broken by the beta lactamase we inhibit that and the ring remains intact. So what are the example of these beta lactamase inhibitors are clavulinic acid, sulbactam, tazobactam, avibactam, so these are all the beta lactamase inhibitors. So of course they can't work in isolation, they work with the beta lactam. So we have something known as the BLBLI. So that is a beta lactam, beta lactamase inhibitor which includes amoxiclav, ticacillin clavulinic acid, piprasilin tazobactam and cefepirazone sulbactam. So these were about the BLBLI. Now in gram positives like staph aureus when I'm talking about beta lactamase, in that I'm mainly focusing on penicillinase. Okay, but for the others it is more important in gram negatives. So uh, now we also have certain drugs which are penicillinase stable like methicillin. Okay, so when we are talking about an MSSA, so even if beta lactamase is positive, Benzyl penicillin will not work, but the penicillin is stable once, like uh, cloxacillin, oxacillin, these could work. Okay, so hence MSSA. Now, what is MRSA? MRSA, here the ring is not hampered, but the site at which the drug gets at attached to, that is affected, that is altered. Hence, the drugs are not able to act. Okay, so that is MRSA. But as you said, so we are talking about methicillin resistant or methicillin susceptible, but we are not mentioning that on the report. So uh, an analog of methicillin is oxacillin. And oxacillin is much more stable drug as compared to methicillin, and hence we use oxacillin. So if it is oxacillin resistant, that means it is going to be an MRSA. Now why are we still continuing with MRSA and not using ORSA? Because history is important, right? So it was always known as MRSA, so it's continued to be MRSA. So when I say it's MRSA, it means it's resistant not only to penicillins, but also to the beta-lactam, beta-lactam inhibitors, the cephalosporins and the carbapenems. Now then came about cefoxetin screen. So what happens, many a times we have a heterogeneous population, that's a mixed population of MSSA and MRSA. So apparently, it looks that it's all MSSA. Now, cefoxetin is an inducer of MEK-A, which is the gene responsible for that altered site in, because of which it becomes MRSA. So what happens? Because of cefoxetin, it induces that. When we give cefoxetin, and in this hetero, 
heterogeneous population, the MRSA gets exposed. So if we use cefoxidin, the chances of missing an MRSA is much less and hence when we give it as cefoxidin screen positive or oxacillin resistant, that means it is an MRSA. Now coming to the next point you asked about inducible clindamycin resistance or the D test that we do. So it's something uh, like a cloak uh, that clindamycin wears and when we remove the cloak, the true demon is actually exposed. So what happens? Abhi, uh, ye don ko pakarna mushkil zarur hai, par nahi. So what can we do? So what happens? In vitro, clindamycin may appear susceptible. But when the patient, if the patient has an inducible clindamycin resistance, many a times it happens that on prolonged uh, usage of clindamycin, it doesn't work anymore in vivo. That's because of the presence of this inducible clindamycin resistance, the ERM gene. So how do we do that? So to catch this Don, we take his, the help of his friend, erythromycin. So here you can see this is the erythromycin disc and this is the clindamycin disc. If we place erythromycin and clindamycin in close proximity, then what happens is so you can see this side, this nice inhibition of zone and we get a big good zone of inhibition. But this side where the erythromycin is present, this clindamycin resistance gets induced and that's why you get this straight line. So we call it as a D test because it looks like a D. So the bacterial growth you can see will continue on the side of erythromycin. But the other side, it is inhibited. So this is a D test positive or clindamycin resistance is seen. So in such patients, we should not use clindamycin. Now, even automated uh, methods like Vitec, they also give this report as inducible clindamycin resistance, positive or negative. Now, if you see these two reports, you can see now clindamycin, MIC here is 0.25, and even on the next one, it is 0.25. But on this I've reported as susceptible and on this it is reported as resistant. The reason being the inducible clindamycin resistance. Now in this report, inducible clindamycin resistance is negative. So you can and plus the clindamycin MICs are in the susceptible zone. So you can give clindamycin. However, if it is ICR positive or inducible clindamycin resistance positive, in that case, even though the MICs are quite low, still in the vivo it will not work and hence it is reported as resistant. Now coming to the most difficult part, it's the MICs. It really took me a long time to understand. Now I have to explain it in another couple of minutes. So I'll try that. So MIC is basically the lowest concentration of an antimicrobial agent that will inhibit the visible growth of microorganisms. So that is the MIC which has been given. But just giving you those MICs may not help, so we use breakpoints which are given by international bodies like CLSI and UCAST on basis of which we determine what does that MIC mean. What you finally want is whether it is susceptible, it is intermediate or it is resistant. So now if I show you this, now this is drug A, B, C with the respective MICs. Apparently, uh, which the lowest MIC seems to be which one? Anybody? B. So maybe drug B would be the best choice. But is that the right way forward? So no, actually we have to look for the efficacy ratio. Efficacy ratio is basically the ratio between the susceptible MIC breakpoint which is given by the international bodies and the MIC of that particular bug to that antibiotic. So if the efficacy ratio is less than one, it is considered to be resistant. And efficacy ratio of more than one is considered susceptible and we can use. So more the efficacy ratio, better would be the choice. Now let us see. Now if I give you the susceptible breakpoints, you can see for drug B, the susceptible breakpoint is 0.5, which is actually lower than what the MIC we have got. And for the drug C, the MIC susceptible breakpoint is 8, which is much higher than what our MIC. So now if I go to the efficacy ratio, apparently B was actually better when I see the MICs, but the true picture is that drug C is best because that has the highest efficacy ratio. I hope I'm able to explain some part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you.
but normally uh, here here dr vikas sorry here from the dais from the dais sorry. anup here so i have a question no so normally when we get the report we don't see the efficacy ratio in the reports we just get to see mic written susceptible or not so is there any standard recommendation by indian pathologist and microbiologist that these efficacy ratio should also be given because we are fooled by these just mic and few of the words correct so agreed so uh, basically we follow clsi guidelines and some follow ucas guidelines which is clsi is by the us and uh, ucas is by the european society of course we uh, determine all of that based on clsi and we give you to make things simpler for you all we just give it to you as susceptible or resistant or intermediate uh, but of course you can ask your microbiologist uh, for what is the clsi breakpoints for the same okay so when they give reports susceptible and not susceptible or resistant it is based on efficacy ratio it is based on the clinical breakpoints which has been given okay. by the clsi or ucast thank you thank you sir thank you uh, in fact that is what i keep asking them why don't you give breakpoints but i don't know they they want to make it difficult for us uh, we are trying to simplify it sir <laughs> okay okay thank you now uh, dr umang if you could tell us the choice of antibiotic use of linezolid which is which is extremely uh, commonly used by orthopedic surgeons and your opinion about rifampicin sure. thank you uh thank you everyone uh, first of all i would like to thank the organizers and dr gashe for giving me the opportunity to present here at wirock so So Agashi sir had basically asked me to clear this particular point about the utility of certain commonly used antibiotics in our daily practice and uh, what is whether it's really going to be useful in these kind of situations. So let's talk a bit about certain antibiotic combinations like cefixime and lenisolid, a very common uh, antibiotic prescription, over-the-counter prescription. Now we need to understand that cefixime is a third-generation cephalosporin. and it is not really that great for mssa it won't work as well as a first or a second generation cephalosporin moreover it has no activity against mrsa either linezolid on the other hand has no activity against mssa so if a patient has come to you with a bone and joint infection you're giving him a combination of cefixime and linezolid you're neither covering the mssa that well neither are you covering the mrsa that well on top of that we are giving a drug called linezolid which is 600 mg pd and generally for bone and joint it will be around 6 weeks of treatment now please understand that this high dose for such a long time can really have very bad uh, side effects including thrombocytopenia lactic acidosis severe peripheral neuropathy and optic neuritis and all this at what cost wherein you're not even achieving a good efficacy isn't it it definitely is not a universal solution a bit about rifampicin another very commonly prescribed drug now rifampicin as far as gram positive infections are concerned are basically used only for biofilm penetration all right only if you have an implant retained inside if the patient does not really have an implant rifampicin is not really going to help that much this particular drug can never be used alone that is because it acquires resistance very fast and especially in patients with uh, bone and joint infections where you require long term treatment this will really be associated with very poor outcomes if used alone we require higher doses so in tb we generally use 600 mg uh, in bone and joint minimum of 900 mg is what is recommended as far as the duration of treatment is concerned depending upon what kind of surgery the patient has and what kind of implant the patient has it may range between 3 to 6 months always remember that whenever you are using rifampicin in a patient who has a retained implant try to use it after 7 to 10 days of antibiotics that is because after 7 to 10 days of directed antibiotic therapy all the planktonic bacteria they are killed at this particular point the efficacy of rifampicin to penetrate the biofilm will be much higher and as i said this can only be used if implant is retained we never uh, recommend it as a sole agent in a non implant related infection or an implant related infection to be very frank it needs to be used in combination now what are the ideal antibiotics for mssa or mrsa so these are the common ones that we have in our market right now so cloxacillin fluclox cefuroxime cefalexin etc for mrsa it's vanco tyco linezolid now you might always say that you have a culture report which shows vancomycin is susceptible for an mssa why not just use it 
because there are numerous studies to show that if you're using vancomycin, linezolid, or tycoplanin in these kind of situations, it's undoubtedly inferior. So moreover, cloxacillin and cefazolin are very cheap antibiotics. Tycoplanin is expensive. Vancomycin, if you're using, you have to do drug levels, which are around 6,000, 7,000 every time you do that level. So using expensive antibiotics, lots of side effects with poor efficacy, especially if used in MSS infections. Now, this particular case, of course, had the implant removed, but suppose that you have a patient wherein who had this MSS infection and an implant was retained. Would we have really treated this? So generally, whenever a patient like this comes in, we always, has a combined, we always have a combined discussion with our orthopedic ID team. And depending upon where a particular patient requires treatment or not, we, on the basis of that, we uh, decide our antibiotic management. In case we feel that antibiotics need to be given, then cloxacillin and rifampicin are the way to go. Uh, handing over back to sir. So friends, uh, the question is, when do we retain the implant? When do we take out? There are some very nice papers. Please read these three papers, which will give you very good indication as to when to retain the implant and when to take out, as well as the duration of antibiotics. A lot depends on whether you're going to retain, whether you're going to remove, whether you are doing a two-stage, whether you're going to do one-stage exchange. And uh, so the decision for retaining or removal of implant boils down to four factors. The construct, duration of infection, construct has to be stable, duration has to be max about four to six weeks. Microorganisms should be reasonably susceptible. You can't uh, keep a, a plate in presence of fungus or non-tubercle mycobacteria or uh, carbapenem resistant bugs. And most important, you should be able to achieve soft tissue cover for implant as well as fracture. So with that, I go to the next case. This is a, another middle-aged person, diabetic, presented at three weeks post-op. And he had fever, severe swelling of the thigh had sinuses and you can see the implant is walking out and has multiple sinuses. His counts were very high, creatinine has gone up and uh, your tobacco chewer had poor oral hygiene. So going to the history, he had a total hip replacement for a fracture neck femur almost six months ago. Six months down the line, he developed a ipsilateral femur fracture and you can see the tip of processes. He was treated with open reduction and plating somewhere. And then this is when he presented, you can see the plate is very near the tip of processes. So most important, of course, aggressive debridement, that is what I did. And this is after removal of the plate, the bones are still covered with dirty granulation tissue, which was removed. And the culture was acinetobacter resistant to everything and Staphylococcus aureus, which is MRSA. So the problems are diabetes, tobacco chewer, significant infection, very poor sensitivity, avascular bone ends, large butterfly fragment, and THR stem, which was very near future pin, wire, or screw, whatever. So question is, what do we do? Uh, this was a paper which uh, we had published last year for carbapenem resistant osteoarticular infections. And one thing, this was a study of almost 20 years. And one thing we realized that you have to compromise in these patients. You have to make some compromises, have external fixator over internal fixation, achieve bone to bone stability by docking the shaped bones minimal time in external fixator. You may compromise on length, but what is important, don't keep it distracted. Take out the non-union machine as early as possible. So this is exactly what we did. We shoved in the proximal end into distal end. That itself made it extremely stable, as you can see here. We put a fixator at four weeks. We could take out the fixator. This is decent callus at six weeks. By eight weeks, we could mobilize him non-weight bearing. This is consolidated at eight months. This is at 18 months, 
pretty good range of movement and extremely happy and a happy patient and surgeon. So Dr. Shauli, uh, can you just tell us basics of difference between gram positive and gram negative bugs? Thank you, sir. This is actually all about microbiology. What is gram positive? What is gram negative? Okay, uh, so you can see this is just a pictorial presentation of how gram positive wall and gram negative wall looks. And you can see that it is definitely way different. It has a gram positive has a thick peptidoglycan layer, whereas gram negatives don't have. Now, since the cell wall is different, the antibiotics which work for each of these is also different. So that I think Umang will take care of what antibiotics to give. What is important here is that gram-positive bacteria, they are present on the skin majorly, <clears throat> which we take care of during the surgical prophylaxis. And resistance in gram-positive, that's majorly a concern of the West and not so much for us. Now coming to gram-negative bacteria, they, these infections are mainly due to translocation from other sites or it could also be nosocomial infections. And multi-drug resistant bugs in gram-negative, it's a huge problem in our setting, in Indian subcontinent. And hence, I would always request, please, please send for cultures and don't start empirical antibiotics by themselves. And even if you start, of course, empirical, but please modify your treatment as per the culture susceptibility report. Thank you. Over to you, Ma. Thank you very much, uh, Shauli. Uh, Dr. Omang, can you tell us a bit about antibiotics for gram-negative infections and the antimicrobial resistance of gram-negative. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I'll first be going through the uh, antimicrobial resistance spectrum. Let's start with the gram-negatives. So this is a common report that you will see. Uh, I'm just going to talk about Klebsiella for now. This is a bug which is susceptible to all antibiotics. This is a pan-susceptible Klebsiella. And we are quite happy you have lots of treatment options. Now what happens? This is what happens. This particular bug is now resistant to uh, ampicillin, cefuroxime, uh, ceftazidine, so third generation cephalosporins, as well as astronym, but it is susceptible to piprocillin, tazobactam, and c 4 cell bactam, that is beta-lactam with beta-lactamase inhibitors. This is called ESBL, that is extended spectrum beta-lactamases, wherein we can try to give piprocillin, tazobactam, c 4 cell bactam, et cetera. Now the levels of resistance are increasing. Now the same bug, you don't have this option of piprocillin tazobactam or cefoperazone cellbactam. This is known as an ESBL plus bug. In this particular case, the only options that we have are carbapenems. So we are kind of going towards deep shit. And now the most dreaded complication of all, even the carbapenems are gone. We hardly have any treatment options here. So we need to consider combination treatment with cholestin, tichycycline, et cetera. And this is, where, this is where we come into play. So most of the references that come to us are at this particular point. These are the drugs that we generally use quite commonly. So these are the levels of gram-negative resistance that we need to know. Another important point about cholestin, so I'm sure that you must have faced these kind of situations at your place as well, wherein the bug is only susceptible to cholestin or intermediate to cholestin. And Many of, many of the prescriptions that we have seen is where the physicians or the orthopedic surgeons are using cholestin as a monotherapy. Now we need to understand that if you're giving full dose of cholestin to a patient for a bone and joint infection, only 5% will reach the bone. You give a patient 100% of cholestin, 80% goes in urine. In the blood, it's just 20% that's left. Out of that 20%, only 25% goes to the bones. So effectively, it's just 5% of cholesterol reaching your particular bone, which is really inadequate. And that is why cholesterol monotherapy for bone and joint infections is never recommended. Another thing, there are certain bugs which, so sometimes if you have negative cultures, patient has been on multiple antibiotics, the general tendency is to go towards cholesterol. But there are certain bugs which are inherently resistant to cholesterol like these, which you will find in your day-to-day -day practice. Uh, Proteus, Providentia, Morganella, etc. So it does not work for all bugs. One last point about cephalosporins, which has been a common question to all of us. What is the importance of this first, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, or fifth generation? What we need to know is as the generation goes, becomes higher, the gram-positive cover reduces, while the gram-negative cover increases. So if you're targeting a gram-positive bug, 
preferable to use first and second generation cephalosporins. If you're using a, if you're targeting a gram-negative bug, preferable to use a third or a fourth generation cephalosporin. Thank you. So, uh, most important question or most commonly asked question is our lab is, I don't know why our lab often gives negative results. So, Shavali, if you could explain what are the causes of negative culture report. So, we do try to grow the bug. We love them a lot. We want to grow them. But sometimes, of course, it does happen that we get negative cultures. So, the possible reasons for that could be as uh, if the patient has been on prolonged antibiotics, then the chances of the bug growing is really less. So, uh, that could be one reason. Then often when we get a CT-guided biopsy, especially in those, we might not get the representative sample of the actually where the site of infection is. Even in that case, it could be culture negative. Sometimes the test selection which has been given to us, maybe you have sent us for bacterial culture and probably the patient has TB or has some fungal uh, pathology and the test selection has been wrong. So it's just sent for bacterial culture and that could be one of the reasons for getting culture negative. And there are certain bugs which are difficult to grow or they are slow growers. Even in that case, it would be culture negative. For uh, antibiotic free interval, ideally uh, would suggest that uh, you should definitely start antibiotics after the sample collection. But we do understand that it's not always feasible. Now, if the patient is stable, then maybe you could stop the antibiotics for two weeks before collecting the culture samples. However, um, in certain cases, like if the patient has fever, has severe pain, or is in septicemia, or has significant purulent discharge, or there's an impending abscess, there's necrotizing fasciitis, of course, I do understand in those cases, you will not be able to give that 15-day uh, break. So in these cases, what could be the possible way forward in which we could improve the uh, culture isolation? In that case, uh, as I said, more the merrier. So more the number of samples you send, the chances of getting the yield is better. Please, please send us tissue samples or synovial fluid or please don't send us swabs. Those swabs are not representative at all and they just give you some rubbish colonizing flora of the skin. So swabs not recommended. As I said, if not an emergency, opt for an antibiotic free period prior to sending cultures. Another thing which even Sir will vouch for which they do quite often is sending samples in automated blood culture bottles. So when you inoculate the automated blood culture bottles directly in the OT and send it to us, the yield definitely improves. And there are certain uh, bottles known as uh, like aerobic, anaerobic plus. So the plus contains raisins which work against the antibiotics. So even if the patient has been on antibiotics, to some extent it is taken care of in these automated blood culture bottles. Certain bugs need a little longer time of incubation. So if you're suspecting uh, those bugs, like in case of brucella, so it needs a longer period of pr uh, prolonged incubation. Sometimes even for staph when we get a tissue, normally the report is no growth at 48 hours, but our policy is that we keep for a week or 10 days any tissue samples. So on day five or day six, we see staph has grown. So we recommend uh, that we keep for prolonged incubation tissue samples. Then uh, when the patient has been on antibiotics, of course, now PCR is the uh, go-to uh, answer for most things. So there is a multiplex PCR from BioFire or even others have it, so which is a joint infection panel where you just need 0.2 ml of the synovial fluid and it covers about 30, uh, it has about 39 targets, about 31 organisms and eight resistant mechanisms. So in one hour, you will know, get to know what the bug is, but this is mainly for synovial fluids and not for others we haven't tried. Thank you. The next question is, uh, will be answered by Dr. Oman. Right. So the next question is how to choose antibiotics if culture is negative. So it all goes onto this. So this is basically after that a physician's job. What's wrong with you is what we need to ask. A detailed history is the first thing that we do. What, was there any history of trauma? Is this a closed fracture or an open fracture? Whether there was any exposure to soil or water, any exposure to beaches, any implants present in your body, any significant past or personal history, what were the previous antibiotics that you got and what was the response to those antibiotics and what was the duration of antibiotic free period? And all these questions are directed to understand the etiology that might be causing this particular problem. 
Now, if you look at core closed structures, uh, generally, depending upon what the history of the patient is, if you are expecting the skin to be the source, then the common bugs that we think of are streptococcus staph and cons. For hematogenous infection coming from the blood directly, from the blood, staph aureus is the most common that we generally think of. From the gut or the urinary tract infections, we think of E. coli, Klebsiella, more of gram negatives. Oral cavity, generally streptococcus if a patient has a dental infection and then he has come in with bone and joint infection and we cannot find any other source, then probably these are the bugs worth covering. Now these are as far as closed fractures are concerned. As soon as you have open fractures, then you have to think of soil related organisms, especially in crush injuries, those who have had a road traffic accident, etc. And the most pertinent ones in this case are gram negative enterix, generally quite drug resistant, pseudomonas and clostridium. If a patient has just recently gone to a beach or there has been some exposure to water, then pseudomonas, NTM infections, burkholderia is something that we really think of. Beaches in specific, aeromonas and vibrios vulnificus. So the antibiotic changes depending upon what kind of scenario the patient has come in. If it's an implant associated infection, depending upon what, at what time does the patient present to you after the surgery, we have a specific list of bugs that we think of and accordingly antibiotics as well. So early, very early infections is generally group A, streptococcus, early infection within four weeks is staph and strep, and delayed infections are generally low level, low level bugs such as corns, NTM, etc. Whether the patient has come from the community or the patient has come from some other setup, our ent entire spectrum changes. So it's quite an exhaustive list. Now I understand that as orthopedic surgeons, your main job is to operate. So we are very happy to assist you. Please involve your physician, please involve your ID physician in your day-to-day -day care in these particular cases wherein they can really help you out with these particular choices. Now, as far as antibiotic use is concerned, there are five specific types of, types of antibiotics that we can use. Prophylactic antibiotics, that is before the microbes enter the body, and I think Dr. Agashe and Dr. Mayang had an excellent debate on that. Preemptive antibiotics are those wherein patient has had an open fracture, Microbes have already entered the body and we are expecting an early infection. Empiric antibiotics are when we are waiting for the cultures to come in, the patient is infected and he's symptomatic. Once the cultures come positive, then you give targeted antibiotics. If the cultures are negative, then you continue with empiric antibiotics. And in places where you have retained an implant, then in those particular cases, chronic suppressive therapy. Thank you. Thank you, Monk. So, uh, essentially, this is a very nice flowchart I picked up from 2018 paper. Has the fracture healed? If it has, then debride and remove the implant. Antibiotics for six weeks. If fracture has not united and it's early infection, if the implant is stable, good reduction and primary closure possible, then debride, retain the implant, continue antibiotics for 12 weeks. If answer to this is no, then do a two-stage exchange. First step is removal of implant and temporary stabilization. Second, continue antibiotics for six weeks. Second step is re-osteosynthesis and antibiotics for six weeks. If it is late infection, more than 10 weeks, then what are you planning to do? Are you planning to suppress the infection or are you planning to eradicate the infection? If you want to eradicate the infection, if you have bad soft tissues, if you have difficult to treat organisms, if the answer to that is yes, then do a two-stage exchange. If the answer to that is no, then do a one-stage exchange. On the other hand, if you think that things are stable and you would like to just suppress infection till fracture heals, then do a deprivement but continue antibiotics till fracture heals. So it would be long-term suppressive antibiotics. So friends, it's essentially a multidisciplinary force that will help you in management of infection. To end friends, these 10 things you have to remember. Thank you very much. May I ask Dr. Parag to... Dr. Parag will be telling us about a new antibiotic that is developed indigenously by
Right. So thank you, Dr. Agashe, Team Vyrock, uh, and all the organizing uh, committee members. Very quickly, I'm going to talk to you all about a new molecule which has been launched in India, and it's called levonidifloxacin. Most of you all are aware of it. We've gone through this. Dr. Umang and Dr. Shauli have said, gram-positive staph strepto are commonly affecting orthopedic infections. 75 to 80 percent of bone and joint infections are related to this. PJI, osteomyelitis, and septic arthritis. Now, this is an important slide. If you look at the ICMR data, MRSA has increased from 28% to 42% between 2016 to 2021. So whether we like it or not, we are seeing more and more of methicillin, MRSA, MSSA, all these mixed colonized infections. Now, what are the problems? Biofilm, we are all aware of. Microbiological polymicrobial mixed infections. And when we get these infections, we need a drug which we can give safely for a longer duration, more than six weeks if need be. Dr. Umang said clearly linozolid causes thrombocytopenia, optic neuritis, etc. So all these drugs have got some secondary side effects. What are the options available? So we've got Clinda, we've got linozolid, we've got Tico, Tigicycline, Dapto, Vanco. All of them have got their drawbacks. There is no such thing as a free lunch. So Vanco and Tico, which we use very commonly, are quite nephrotoxic. And mind you, they are very slow bactericidal agents. On the other hand, linozolid is bacteriostatic. Orthopedic surgeons often forget that. And longer usage will cause thrombocytopenia. There's no escaping from that, coupled with optic neuropathy. So Dapto, TG, I think most orthopedic surgeons would not start. They would wait for the infection diseases or the ICU consultant to start. But they too have their handicaps. Now, this is a molecule which has been developed here locally, and this is a product which has come out after 20 years of research by the Walkhard Group. It has got 40 international authorship publications. It's come into 15 peer-reviewed journals, and it's a local product developed in India. It has undergone 18 trials. Six have been in the United States. The last phase three has been in India as well, and quite importantly, it has got this QIDP stamp from the American US FDA. So it means a qualified infectious disease product based on the coverage of six CDC identified threat pathogens. So it's called MROC. Quite a few of you all have used it as I was talking. It's IV as well as oral, 800 milligram as an infusion BD, or 1000 milligram twice a day, and it's improved by the DCGI. We saw all the coverages, all the spectrums. We are seeing a lot of mixed flora and polymicrobial infection. So what does this drug cover? It covers gram-positive, a select gram-negative group, atypicals, and some anaerobes as well. But prima facie, we are using this for gram-positive infections. So levonadofloxacin. So look at this. This was conducted at CMC Vellore, 793 staph aureus patients. And if you look at the MIC, so MIC is 0.25. So 50% of the colony is destroyed with 0.25 microgram per ml. It goes to 0.5. And you look at the data comparing Vanco, Linozolid, and Levofloxacin. So this is clearly a more potent molecule. This chart shows you the rapid bactericidal action. So when you start this drug, within 90 minutes, you've got the CFUs dropping down drastically, and within eight hours, it virtually comes down to baseline. When you compare it with the other drugs, you can see it's a much flatter curve. So this has got a very rapid kill of the bacteria. Biofilm, which we all talk about. So in vitro, when you look at the biofilm studies, this is what it looks like. So the electron microscopy study shows that you've got these bacteria lost all along the plates. When you use Dapto or Clinda or Linozolid, this is the scanty growth which you will still have remaining. And when we use this drug, levonadifloxacin, you have virtually eradication of all the bacteria. More importantly, we all want to use a drug which has got good bone, synovial fluid, and synovial fluid, synovitis, killing properties. So excellent bone penetration is again what you see with this molecule. And most importantly, it has a high safety profile. So it has been used in more than 2,600 clinical subjects. Greater than 35,000 patients have been used across the country. 
It has not shown any cardiac toxicity, no nephrotoxicity, no thrombocytopenia, which we see with the linozolid, and it has got no drug-drug interaction. So this can be used very safely, even up to 41 days continuously as need be. A real-world study, it showed that in 92 patients, at 14, day 14, at 14 days post-starting, 90% cure rates are seen. And if you have to extend the study up to 28 days, you've got virtual 100% reduction in the bacterial count. So this can be safely extended and it has a high cure rate. And finally, the advantages. If you look at this chart, this drug is broad spectrum, it's bactericidal, it has a potent biofilm penetration, no thrombocytopenia, and it enhances its activity because of its molecular structure, even in an acidic environment, which means if you have a pussy wound as well, this will penetrate. So this is clearly superior to what is available. So take home message, it is a locally indigenously developed product. It is available in IV and oral, so when you want to stop IV and convert to oral, the bioavailability is not lost. It treats all MDR gram-positive infections, including MRSA, MSSA, VRI, so vancomycin resistant, with a broad spectrum coverage, and it has an excellent safety profile. Thank you. Thank you very much, Parak, for an excellent uh, talk on uh, possibly a great weapon in our armamentarium. I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Shauli, Dr. Uh, Umang Agar Agrawal, and Dr. Parag Munshi. Thank you very much, friends.